a city which needn't be mentioned. On a street with no name, there is a house without a number. to the house of, oh, let me see. What did I say my name was? Well, no matter. The name is false and the passport's forged. But then in my line of work, nothing is ever what it seems. I don't mean elaborate disguise. Only the amateur goes on a mission as if it were a masquerade party. False mustaches make excellent targets for firing squads. Take me, for instance. A simple walking stick provides the best of all disguises. Respectability, solid, conservative, harmless. But, as I said, things are not always what they seem. As a matter of fact, the young American lady who last used this instrument was not exactly what she seemed to be either. Espionage in the Federal Army of the Shenandoah. Bell Boyd was an accomplished professional spy. They were absolutely wrong. She was an accomplished amateur spy. Although in a bloody civil war, which was fought almost entirely by amateurs, her lack of professional training was not the handicap it would be today. In 1861, the southern state of Virginia was one of the first battlefields in the great struggle to decide whether the Confederate States and the hitherto United States were to be separate countries. Union troops probing south after the elusive Stonewall Jackson in an optimistic attempt to settle the question occupied the town of Front Royal, Virginia, where they tried to make it a social error to whistle Dixie. slip of a girl named Belle Boyd. She had no attributes of a spy whatsoever, neither cleverness, nor ingenuity, nor contacts. She had only a passion for the Confederacy, and the fact that she was a woman on her side. But she lived in an age when sometimes that was enough. Certainly it was enough for the commander of the occupying force, Major General James Shields. You are Miss Boyd, Miss Isabel Boyd. Well, baptized, Isabel. But law, nobody in front row would know me by that calling. I answer the bells and so high. Sit down, please. Miss Boyd, you look to me like a girl of good breeding and character. Why, thank you, General Shields. Proud to go to hear that. Thank you. Well, Miss Boyd, do you think it proper then for a young girl of 19 to go about slashing soldiers with sword canes? Even Union soldiers? Well, I don't know what came over me, General. I, I declare, I just don't. Well, I, I saw that soldier boy tearing at that flag, and then well, everything went kind of black. That was a flag of rebellion, Miss Boyd. So was your flag once, General. Would you like a Britisher to go tearing into your daddy's hotel while he's off fighting and, and just rip it down? Miss Boyd, there are people here in Front Royal that say I ought to put you in the lockup. That you're a hot-headed rebel. Never reform. Oh, the terrible, jealous-tongued people. Now, Miss Bell, if I forget all about this, I don't want to hear anything more about you. General Shields, I'm a Virginia woman. And when a Virginia woman gives her word, even to a northern gentleman, she keeps it. Oh, I won't be troublesome again, I promise. All right, Miss Boyd. Go on now, and remember your promise. 
Oh, thank you kindly, General. I won't make any more mistakes. With her idol, Stonewall Jackson, bivouacked only seven miles away, Belle Boyd, without authorization or training, undertook to supply him with whatever intelligence would help him restore the stars and bars over Front Royal. And I counted 16 cannons and later saw seven in the workshop. They were thicker than saw logs and the Yankees call them 12 pounders. Though I'm sure they weigh a power more than that. Yours for Southern rights and sacred honor, Belle Boyd. Incredible as it may seem, these naive and sometimes useful little notes were somehow actually delivered to General Jackson. But Belle was not content to let others take her risks. And she was determined to seek out the one man who could give her amateur patriotism some professional standing. How do, ma'am? How do? It's all right. I know. What'd you say? I said it's all right. I know who you are. Ma'am, I don't know what you're talking about. You're Colonel Ashby, General Jackson's head scout. Ma'am? I saw you four years ago at a church fair here in Front Royal. I remember your face. Ah, uh, you've mistook me for someone else. My name is Morris, Townsend Morris. I'm York State loyal. Don't call me Secesh. But you can trust me. Lady, please. I'm Belle Boyd. Oh, surely General Jackson has told you something about me. I've been sending him information. I don't know what you're talking about, but it sounds like serious business. Now, you just... Go on home, Miss Boyd. Colonel Ashby, please. Miss Boyd, what do you want? Just what do you want? I want a volunteer for spy work. What? You crazy girl coming around here saying a thing like that? But there was no other way to get to you. Oh, I want to help. I've been sending messages already. Yes, in plain English. And you signed your name. I'm sorry. I didn't know any other way to write. I'm sorry. Miss Boyd, you just don't volunteer for spy work. Right out of the blue. It's not like a charity ball committee. Well, teach me then. That's what I'm asking you. Teach me so that I can truly help. My name is not Ashby, and I don't know what you're talking about, and I'm busy. Now, go on home. I won't go home. I'll just stay here. Just sit and looking at you until you decide you can trust me. That's just what I'll do, Colonel Ashby. I'll just stay here. Will you please quiet down? You'll get us both caught. All right. All right. Now, you listen to me. Colonel Turner Ashby was a hard-bitten professional agent, head of Jackson's scouts. He knew the risk of working with amateurs, but he couldn't stand up to an iron will, clothed in crinoline petticoats. So, at considerable risk to both of them, Bell continued to meet secretly with Ashby, and in a few short weeks of training, she became officially a Confederate spy. Because Union counterintelligence wouldn't suspect anyone who couldn't tell a 12-pounder cannon from a Bowie knife, Bell made an excellent courier, relaying messages from Ashby to various drops or relay stations in the Shenandoah Valley. Technically, she was still an amateur, but she had one talent that Ashby lacked. She was a woman. Why, Lieutenant Connie, I'll wake every girl for Riverwood, you say that. <laughs> you flatter me, Miss Boy. May I? Mm -hmm. You were sugar sweet, as caught me home, Lieutenant. Night. Bell. You 
anybody comes in. I was looking for a room and stumbled in here by mistake. You can be highly indignant and order me out. Bill, that lieutenant is from the Provo Marshal's office. I know. He thinks I'd dance a mite too wickedly, but otherwise he trusts me. Strikes me you're taking the chances. I had to see you right away. Now, you have got to get this to Winchester sometime tomorrow. Take it to Edmonds on Rutledge Street. He'll see that it gets to Jackson. Why, surely, but what? Well, I haven't any other courier. I'd go myself. But they've captured Captain Hardy, and I have to go to Martinsburg to take his place. Now, that's in cipher. But if you have to destroy it, remember this. Go ahead. Fremont and Banks appear to be readying to join McDowell. Now, that could mean a move against Richmond. Shields may be just a covering force. Any attack from Shields may be just a feint. You follow me? I do. Fine. One thing, the Yankees have closed off Winchester. They won't give passes to civilians. I don't need a pass. And there the poor girl was, her ankle showing just like this and everything. <laughs> we all laugh at the cry. Oh, I do love to go rolling along just like this in real style. I just knew it'd be no trouble at all for you to get us a pass. Why, well, I didn't exactly get a pass. I don't reckon we need one to go to Winchester on military business. Mm -hmm. After all, what are these pumpkin rinds for? Mm -hmm. Why, we're slowing down. Yes, we are. Maybe your horse is hurt. Hey, what's wrong? Why are we stopping? It's funny. I'll find out what it is in a minute. Will you come out, please? Now, look here. You will come out, please, and bring all your things with you. Mr. I'm an officer in the Union Army. And who are you? Walters. Federal Army detective. Now, will you come out, please? I have a wagon waiting. Accusations. We are merely acting on some information that we've received about you. Miss Belle Boyd, isn't it? Might be, sir. If we were properly introduced. Perhaps we can be. We know some of the same people, I think. Did you get your information from that old Martha Mae Richards? She's just being spiteful. Now, see here. This lady happens to be under my protection, Mr. Walters. Major Walters, Lieutenant. You're in the Provo Marshal's office, aren't you, Lieutenant? Yes, I am, sir. Then presumably you were traveling toward Winchester on official military business? Well, yes, of course. I heard there were some stragglers from the 3rd Illinois, and I... You may be seated, Miss Boyd. In my own house? <laughs> Thank you for your courtesy. I'll stand. Then, Lieutenant, Miss Boyd was your prisoner? Prisoner? I was traveling for personal reasons, mister. Visiting my cousin Amanda on Albemarle Street. And if that's a threat to the Republic... That remains to be seen, Miss Boyd. Will you remove your shoes, please? Now, look here, sir. Try to restrain your sense of chivalry, Lieutenant. I've sent for the wife of...
Colonel Sterling. When she arrives, you will be taken into another room and searched. Thank you. Now your parasol and reticule, please. Well, if a Virginia officer ever did this, his own regiment would horsewhip him out of camp. Telling a lady you're gonna rip off her clothes. Your emergency field rations, Lieutenant. I presume you packed this basket, Miss Boyd. Indeed I did. The folks in Winchester have just been starving ever since you Yankees invaded it. That food was for my cousin Amanda. Is your cousin Amanda partial to poison? Just what do you mean, poison? I mean this, the Virginia Resister. This is a seditious newspaper, Miss Boyd. Its publication has been forbidden. Mere possession of a single copy is an act of treason. Bell! On my honor, sir, I didn't know. How Abe Lincoln burned my farm. Banks, the butcher, now called baby murderer. Enlistments open in Kenyon's Yankee killers. How does it feel, Lieutenant, to be an accomplice to an incendiary? Well, you see, sir, I didn't know. All right. What's this all about, Walters? May I see you, sir? Where did you get these newspapers, young lady? Boy, I knew once. Came right up to me on the street and said, if you're going to Winchester, give these newspapers to a mutual friend. The only reason I agreed was because I... I once loved that boy very much. And what is this boy's name? I don't rightly remember. And this mutual friend, was he an old beau, too? Oh, that's right. And I wish I could think of his name. And I wish you could. Because until you do, was she carrying any other papers? None that I could find, sir. But Colonel Sterling's wife will be here in a minute. What's that paper in your hand? What paper? Oh, who it is? <laughs> Why, it's a personal shopping list. I imagine it's very important for your Yankee War Department to know that... that... Southern girls still wear camisoles and shimmies X. <laughs> Seems your your General McClellan is mighty concerned about corset covers and hair pressing. Begging the General's pardon, sir. Lieutenant Carney, abetting the smuggling of seditious literature is a court martial offense. You will place yourself in arrest until charges are made. What is it? Your pardon, General. This, this here just came on telegraph. Yeah. It, it says urgent, General. Oh. Walters, you can go. Walters, we can discuss this whole business more fully at some future time. Lieutenant, you are being released from arrest, but not from observation. Your career may be balanced against your deportment in the next few weeks. As for you, little Miss Rebel. Bell had done it again. By deliberately planting the decoy newspapers where they would inevitably be found if she was apprehended, and carrying the red-hot treason openly in her hand, incredible as it may seem, she escaped with a severe scolding. She still had to deliver that message to Jackson, but on her own amateur initiative, decided to hold it up because the message General Shields had just received might be of even greater interest. If it could release an officer from arrest, she knew it could signify only one thing, an impending battle. Where's the key to this door, Miss Bell? The dining room? Why, your big fat colonel took the keys to all our public rooms. What he suspicions? Why? Well, just be sure that's all. Shoulder straps are coming, and they want this place quiet. Staff meeting. 
Your people are supposed to leave my dining room free by evening. Now, while they are staff meeting, where do my guests get their supper meal? Now, you tell me that. Send them over to the Willoughby house. The food's better there anyhow. Well. Officers meeting in her dining room were Yankee enough arrogance to bell. But when their shoulder straps bore as many stars as these, and the shoulders were attached to faces she recognized from the illustrated papers, she knew this was going to be something special. Where are you going? Well, is that a gentlemanly thing to ask of a lady? I'm on duty here. It's my place to ask. Well, then it's my place to tell you that it's past my bedtime. I'm sure your Mr. Lincoln would have no objection to my retiring to my room. Boyd was no military genius, but she had heard enough to know that if she had delivered her first message, she'd have lulled Jackson into a fatal sense of false security. A trap was being prepared, that much she knew. And no time now to relay the warning by way of the message drop in Winchester. She would have to deliver the information herself, even if it meant taking the most dangerous path in espionage, through the enemy picket lines. Regulation says we've been in these murdering woods with no relief since. Silence now. I heard something. <laughs>
so Bell Boyd found Jackson and warned him of the trap. With this knowledge, he was able to strike each of the Union divisions separately before they could combine against him. Jackson's victories in May of 1862 so frightened the federal government that they pulled McDowell's corps back to defend their own capital, leaving McClellan without enough men to take Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy. And so the war which might have ended then and there, if the Union Army had been able to take Richmond, was prolonged for almost two years more. And all because of a girl with incredibly trim ankles. Which reminds me... Oh, yes, I'll see you next week. Respectability.